everyone. Hi everyone. Welcome back. Just to yeah, welcome um, back to the Marine Lab. Yeah, this is our sixth live stream. Mm -hmm. If you missed our other ones, they're under the um, video section on the Point Blue Facebook page. Hello, Hello. Quinn. Quinn says hi. <laughs> Top fan. <laughs> um, and then our last live stream, unfortunately, um, with us as your host is on March 9th at the same time, um, 11. And that live will be all about the 2020 wrap up. We're gonna talk about um, data that we found and just the results mm -hmm. of all of the projects that you guys learned about with these live streams. And there will also be kind of like a trivia game and see if you guys are really listening in. <laughs> and just a Q&A about um, us, our time here, what we plan on doing afterwards and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So hope you guys can tune in for that in the next month. Yeah. Sad Rebecca's leaving me. But yeah. Yeah. But it'll be good to kind of sum up all of our, um, you know, videos here. And yeah, today we'll be talking about kind of the last project we do here um, in the lab. So it'll be good to have all of them on Point Blue's Facebook page for people to check out whenever they want to. Yeah, pretty yeah. much six big projects that happened in this mm -hmm. lab. Yeah. So let's see who's here. Hi, Meredith. Hello. 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 Um, Lishka. Okay. Also let us know if there's any technical difficulties, if you have viewed our last ones. Yeah. There always seems to be something mm -hmm. um, wrong with the Wi-Fi or whatnot. So we have it projected on our computer so we can see, but also let us know if you need to repeat anything or um, just slow down. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, I guess we can get started. Yeah. Hi everyone, oh, Meredith's <laughs> here too. Hi, Meredith and Lishka. Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, so welcome back to the Marine Lab. I'm Olivia. I'm Rebecca. And <laughs> I'm Maria. <laughs> we have a surprise yeah, guest. Surprise <laughs> guest. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll start out. Um, I started my assistantship here um, back in September of 2019 after graduating from California State University of Monterey Bay, where I got a degree in molecular biology. And um, as my position is winding down here in the lab, I will actually be going out to the Farallon Islands mm -hmm. to join the seabird, uh, the summer seabird crew, which is exciting. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Farallons today with our, um, with our California sea lion diet study. But yeah, and then after that, I will be going to Oregon State University um, to study microplastics <coughs> in tofu fish. Yeah, and I started with Point Blue in January of 2020, and I will be here until the middle of March of this year. I graduated from Humboldt State University in May of 2019 with a wildlife biology degree, and I have since had various positions working with marine wildlife, specifically seabirds, and I will be continuing that path um, also on the Farallon Islands this summer, also on the seabird crew, but I will be collecting data for a graduate study um, on the Brant's cormorant populations that reside on the Fairlawn Islands. It's very exciting. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, I recently started uh, working in the lab um, in January uh, 2021. Um, so I'm a first year graduate student at, um, in the Interdisciplinary Marine and Estuarine Science Program at San Francisco State University. Um, the program is also known as River Tides, um, and it's based out of the Estuary and Ocean Science Center. Um, so my advisor is Dr. Ellen Hines, and my thesis is in collaboration with Point Blue Conservation Science, so that is why I'm here with you guys today, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so after I get my graduate degree, I, uh, I plan on applying to veterinary school um, to continue to help animals in any way that I can. Another member of our lab who unfortunately can't join us over video today is our manager, Meredith Elliott, and you've seen she's in the comments, and she will be answering your questions if we don't get to them, um, but we will do our best to get to those questions as we go along. 
But yeah, as you can see, our COVID pod has expanded to include Maria, um, and we all three live in housing generously provided by Point Blue, so that's why we are here without masks on today, um, but we have been following all the COVID guidelines, and our, um, the lab still remains closed to volunteers and visitors, but we're looking forward to when that can reopen someday. <laughs> And yeah, um, welcome back to our sixth live stream. And for those of you who missed our other live streams, those are still available on Point Blue's Facebook page. So go check those out if you haven't already. And so yeah, in all those live streams, we've talked about the ways we look at seabird diet, but today we'll be transitioning to talk about how we look at the California sea lion diet. Um, so yeah, it gets a little smellier in here. Um, but yeah, so, during our France Cormorant video, we talked about Point Blue's partnership um, on the Farallon Islands a little bit, and that is also where these sea lion scat collections happened. Um, so Point Blue uh, works with U.S. Fish and Wildlife on the southeast Farallon Islands. So you can see here, it's a beautiful island. It is the largest of the islands in the Farallon Island National Marine Refuge. Um, in the surrounding waters, uh, are part of the Greater Farallons uh, National Marine Sanctuary. So as you can see, there are some houses on this island. And so these are actually like from the 1800s, these houses. But um, like I said, Point Blue's partnership with U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, allows our biologists to occupy the island and study the marine mammals and the seabirds that reside on the island. So the Farallon Island is inaccessible to the public. Um, but that makes it a great spot for um, researchers to study uh, these populations um, on this island. And especially because this island has a lot of wind-driven upwelling that occurs. So as the wind blows over the surface, um, the water from deep below gets pushed up to the surface, bringing in lots of nutrients for all the fish and marine mammals, um, everything that lives around the island. So. Um, so Cephi, or the Southeast Farallon Island, is a hot spot for a lot of wildlife biodiversity um, and also provides habitat for these animals away from lots of human interaction. And so the California sea lion is the most common pinniped or seal or sea lion found on the Farallon Islands, but some other, um, some other creatures are the uh, harbor seals and fur seals and also elephant seals, and those latter two uh, have recently returned to the island after experiencing like a local extinction due to hunting for their furs, but conservation efforts by um, biologists have seen uh, an increase in these populations, so that's really exciting to see. And I will turn it over to Rebecca to talk more about the California sea lions specifically and why we study their diet. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, so before we get into um, fun facts about the California sea lion, I want to ask all of you if you know the differences between a seal and a sea lion. They're cousins, um, and they kind of occupy the same range in certain areas, so you will come across them um, and have to know certain identification skills to key to species. Um, so yeah, just type in your guesses. <laughs> Let's see if you guys know your pinnipeds, also seals, sea lions. Size, um, from Linda. Quinn says, one has ears. <laughs> um, cool, good guesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll keep getting those in, but I'll start going over them. Chris says, sea lion have ears. <laughs> yeah, you guys are very smart. Um, but let's get into specifics. So both have ears, <laughs> they can uh, hear, but the sea lion has ear flaps. So it's just a flap over the actual hole, which is their ear, that can be seen from a distance. So that's a very distinctive um, feature of sea lions. Um, so good job on that. All you guys know that, that's ear really flaps. well. Um, whereas the seal, here's another picture of the ear flap. Um, the seal just has the hole, <laughs> and you can really um, only see it when you're close or if it's like wet and um, the fur is away from the hole. Um, so yeah, that's a very um, good thing to look for when you see some pinnipeds laying around. And then another feature is their hind flippers. 
So the seal, it extends directly behind them and it is incapable, or they're incapable of rotation. And um, so the sea lion is much longer of the flippers and they can rotate. And so this difference causes a difference in how they move on land. So the seal, <laughs> they kind of use their, um, their body to get around on land in like a caterpillar motion. And um, the sea lion will use those hind flippers, rotate them forward and walk on them or gallop. And they also use their front flippers, which are much longer than the seal's front flippers. So yeah, just some um, little differences to look out for when you see a pile of um, seals or sea lions to impress your friends. So yeah, the star of the show, the California sea lion. They range from southeast Alaska down to the central coast of Mexico, and they occupy coastal waters on beaches, islands, docks, buoys, and jetties. And they are very a very social animal. So they are found in large groups. Um, these groups can reach up to 100 sea lions per dock. <laughs> They're just like on each other and they bark like dogs. They like to make themselves known out there in the wild, um, which I'm sure you guys have noticed, especially if you live here in the San Francisco area. Um, so yeah, they're very communicative, but a fun fact about that is the females and their pups, their babies, they have special vocalizations that are unique to them. So after the female goes out and forages in the ocean and comes back to this huge group of sea lions, she can find her pup, her baby, from their unique vocalization. So she'll go towards that sound and then she'll sniff her pup because they have a unique scent as well and that can verify that that is indeed her baby. Really cool. And so when they're not lounging around and barking at each other, they are at sea foraging. And so their prey ranges from various squid species and fish. So some of those fish species include northern anchovy, um, mackerel, rockfish, and Pacific hake, just to name a few. And all of these fish communities are very abundant in upwelling areas, like Olivia mentioned. So here in the marine lab, we study the population that resides on the Southeast Fairland Islands. And this population is there year round, so we get a really good idea of the prey communities annually. And to do so, you guessed it, we study their fecal matter, <laughs> their poop. So biologists on the Farallon Islands will collect poop samples for us and send it to the lab for us to further analyze. And by looking at the diet of the California sea lion, we're able to understand the fish communities in the greater Farallon National Marine Sanctuary and how it's changing annually, which is really important because as Olivia mentioned, this is a marine hotspot. A lot of um, marine wildlife rely on the waters surrounding this island to successfully breed and just survive. So I'm getting an understanding of that um, is crucial in conservation of the Farallon Islands. And so now Maria is going to talk about the not so glamorous way we go through those poop samples and how it relates to her grad project. All right, um, it's Rebecca. So um, first I wanted to give a little bit of background um, on my study. Um, so as you guys may know, uh, the world around us, the earth around us is changing. Um, you may see, I've seen on the news, um, there's an increased fire, storms, sea levels rising, and so much more. Uh, well, my study is a chance to understand how um, environmental changes can affect an ecosystem. Um, so an effective way to do this is to um, study an indicator species. So what is an indicator species? It's a species that allows um, manage management as well as researchers to infer the overall health of an ecosystem. Um, the, um, and the, instead of focusing all of our um, resources on each species, we can study a top predator like the California sea lion um, or you know some of the species that you guys have looked at on episodes before and make um, informed management decisions. So these de decisions are um, part of what's called a manage uh, ecosystem-based management plan that takes in consideration um, 
indicator species and the whole ecosystem. So for my research, I'll be using six years of data. So that's from fall 2014 um, to fall 2020. Um, this means that my data will include um, a marine temperature anomaly. Um, so the blob uh, that happened um, from 2014 to 2016 and then after uh, 2017 from to 2020. So the marine temperature anomaly or the blob, um, what it is is it pretty much um, increased the sea surface temperature in a region. Um, so this, um, this caused fluctuations in the prey species um, that surround the area and this can be um, challenging for some of the species that rely on, that, on those prey um, on that prey availability. So as marine scientists, it's important to study these, these diets and um, get a feel for what prey is available for these animals year, yearly and in different seasons. Um, so, um, you know, one of the ways, so we want to think of ways that are least invasive but will help the animal. Um, so one of the ways is studying their poop. Um, so it's funny, I've been an animal technician for six years, so I have cleaned a lot of poop and now I'm studying it. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned, the California sea lion feces is picked up on the island. It is um, put into a bag, labeled, and then frozen. The bag is then brought to the lab to be analyzed. Um, and But since COVID, um, there the process used to be different, but since COVID, um, there's been a bit of changes. So we'll go ahead and um, start talking about how we actually do that. So this could be broken up into three, um, into three different um, steps. So we clean the poop, we pick at the poop, and then we identify the poop. So what we're really looking for are otoliths, which are uh, fishier bones. Um, cephalopod beaks and uh, scales from fish. So um, yeah, so let's get to how we show you guys how to do this. Um, I went through a lot, so if you guys have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the um, comments section and we'll go through them as we're going through the process. Yeah, and I think there is a question about if the podcast will be able to um, be viewed after the live is done. Yes, all of these live streams are Save to the Point Blue Facebook page. Um, I think Leishka put the link in there. Um, so yeah, you can send it to your friends or watch this later if you don't have time. Uh, so yeah, let's get into the smelling process. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... I should put the camera maybe. All right, here we go. <laughs> Let us know if we experience any technical difficulties while we come out here to our garage. <laughs> we process the sample away from the lab because it is very gross. <laughs> Mammal so, poop is very different from bird poop. <laughs> so we start off by um, putting on our handy gloves because these samples are gross. Mm -hmm. So here's one of them. It's pretty gross and they're labeled as you guys can see. Mm -hmm. And it's frozen so we leave this to thaw. Um, once it's thawed we go ahead and we put it into one of these um, into one of these mesh bags. The mesh bag is then um, shut with a rubber band and then it's placed into this cute little washing machine. <laughs> So um, then it goes through the cycle. Um, after the cycle's done, we go ahead and we dump the water out and we repeat the process just to try to get a lot of that um, gunk out of it. Um, once it's done, we go ahead and we grab what remains in the bag, which should be um, pretty much narrowed down to scales and um, fish bones and stuff, but you'll go ahead and see that later. Um, and then we put it into the sheet and we dump it all on there and then we'll rinse it and um, clean it and then we'll put it into a big petri dish that we can then take into the lab. Yeah, and we have one prepared for you already so we'll go back to the lab. 
Alicia said it was a little hard to hear Maria. If we need to repeat anything, let us know. So we keep our washed samples under the fume hood. We're trying to decrease mm -hmm. contamination from mammal poop as much as possible. Yes, PPE. <laughs> very important. Very, they have lots of parasites and all kinds of bad bacteria. So we can go ahead and grab one of the samples. So as you guys see, this is one of those petri dish that I was talking about. Um, so we'll put it under the microscope. And then And we'll do our handy dandy microscope attachment. Mm -hmm. But here's what it looks like after being washed. Alicia's asking if it smells now. Now that this dish is open, yes. <laughs> it's not the best smell. All right, how's that look for everybody? Yeah. So you can go ahead and Okay, so what we wanna look for are um, otoliths, and um, cephalopod beaks and scales. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff in here. There's um, other fish bones, um, but we're trying to look for and narrow things down. Yeah. So, can you get closer on it or? Yeah. Let me zoom. So I think this is an odor right here. I don't know where this is at. <laughs> is it? No, it's not. Okay, so that's, I thought that was an otolith. It's not. It looks like a scale. So here it's are some scale. scales, if you guys can see those. Mm -hmm. So we want to go ahead and pull these out, and then we put them into a Petri dish that we have on the side. So we go ahead and we go through, and this sample has a lot of scales, so... Yeah, and by identifying fish scales, we can identify what species of fish this sea lion has eaten. Fish scales are kind of like a fingerprint. They're very unique to each species, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then in the comments, I see Lishka says, what are otoliths again and cephalopod? Yeah, so otoliths are those ear bones, like Meredith said, um, that are found inside the fish's head and they can be identified to species and also by counting those it can tell us how many of each fish this sea lion ate that day whereas the scales only kind of tell us if like they're present or absent in their diet so um, usually we'll find lots of scales as compared to otoliths where we might only find a couple but yeah and then the cephalopod beaks are yeah like Meredith said in the chat, are mouth parts of cephalopods, which are octopuses and squids. And so, I don't know if we have any in this sample, but we'll show you guys um, ones that we've found later. And yeah, they're very cool. And those also can, we can determine the species of, um, based on the coloring and the shape of the beaks. Yeah, there's some good scales there. Mm -hmm. Do we want to pull those out? Yeah, it's like a scavenger hunt. Yeah. With all of the, these things. Yeah, it looks like an otolith right there. Or a partial one. Oh, was it? There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so as you can imagine, <laughs> these otoliths have traveled through the digestive tracts of, you know, the sea lion, so sometimes they aren't intact. Mm -hmm. So here's... Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, actually, 
Now that it's sideways, I don't know if that is an only. <laughs> yeah, it looks kind of, that's why I didn't pull it out. Yeah. <laughs> kind of looks like a shell. Just kidding, that probably wasn't an only. <laughs> Sometimes the shells can resemble otoliths, mm -hmm. making it a challenge for us scientists. So, yeah, lots of bones, rocks. So we see a bunch more scales. So we try to get all the scales that we can out. Trying to see if we can find an otolith. Is that one? Mm -hmm. no, yes. Probably not. No, right? We can show them, like, don't. Okay. Yeah. So. But yeah, basically, this has, you know, all those parts that weren't washed away with the water, so there's a, it takes a lot of time to get all these scales out of the sample. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and show you guys um, one of the plates that was prepared before that kind of shows the otoliths after we've picked them out. So here they are. Yeah, these look, might look familiar from one of our last live streams. Does anyone remember what species this otolith is? That'd be really impressive. Yeah, I'd be impressed. <laughs> Meredith, don't chime in. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really good fish to be eaten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very nutritious for every marine wildlife. Mm -hmm. Any guesses? No guesses. <laughs> I know there's a lag. Mm -hmm. um. Oh, <laughs> Meredith. <back guess. laughs> So here. Yeah, that's kind of a hard question. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maria, you can tell them. <laughs> so, oh, put them on wait. a salad? Marissa got it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yay. Marissa, gold star. <laughs> and Lishka kind of was on the right track. Keep Some people do put them, do on, put a them on a salad. <laughs> oh. Or on pizzas. It's kind of strange. <laughs> yeah, you guys are right. Northern anchovy. Yeah. So we did get a few of those in this sample. So as you guys can see, Years. a lot so this is actually a species that's pretty good for the california sea lion it has high um energy um it's a really energetic food source for them uh, yeah and then i think there was an otolith in here that was different right here so this is actually broken in pieces so we can kind of see together um, try to put it together <laughs> yeah so that's a um, it's the cake right it's mm -hmm. Pacific cake um, so that species I believe is a little bit less nutritious for um, the California sea lion so although it did have quite a few anchovies, so that's good. So this is probably a pretty healthy sea lion. Mm -hmm. Let me show some scales. So let's switch over to the scales. So um, here are all the scales. <laughs> so you can see there's a lot of scales, and I picked a few things that aren't scales in there. <laughs> so, um, let me see if I could push these so we can see just one. guesses for what scales these belong to <laughs> we're prepping you guys for your next live stream yeah <laughs> oh Lishka um, says how does that sample compare with other ones you've analyzed and are you seeing any overall trends 
coming into any or slash coming to any conclusions yet about marine health. Mm. So we have been seeing, um, I think in these samples, I've been seeing a lot of northern anchovies. At least one pops up. Um, so that's good for the marine health. Um, what about on the other samples? Yeah, so, you know, kind of the samples vary year to year. Mm -hmm. And kind of like Maria was saying, there are anomalies where there's like a, a marine heat wave or like the blob that comes through that changes these communities. But, um, yeah, and I think there was a time where anchovy were less common and that yeah. was seen in lots of uh, marine predators being less productive those years. So that's good we're seeing anchovy return. Yeah. Yeah, so Marissa thinks these are rockfish. We can zoom in a little bit, take a closer look. They do look similar to rockfish. But it's probably yeah. croaker. I would, right? Yeah, I would say these are croaker. And you want to explain why you think these are croaker? So I'm pretty sure because of the annuli, which are those round circles at the bottom of um, the scale. So you can see them here. They kind of remind me of like um, trees. You know how trees have those round um, circles or fingerprints as Rebecca mentioned. So yeah. Yeah, yeah rockfish tend to have like a almost a V shape where all these rings kind of merge whereas croaker generally has a wide center ring. Um, so yeah, they do look similar with especially those radii. So there's like kind of lines that come down from the top of the scale are called radii. Uh, rockfish mm -hmm. also have those. Oh yeah. So then the ones next to it, you can see there, they're, they look pretty different. They're kind of flaky. You know which one? Um, the Higgs scale. The this one? Uh, where you were, oh wait. Oh wait, that one's croaker, just kidding. Never yeah. mind. <laughs> um, let's try to get a different one. This one is different, right? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Focus in on that one. So, here's this one. Nice. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what that one is? Yeah, this would be a greenling. Mm -hmm. so very different. So. It's um, a little bit more like circular, not circular, like um, oval, you can mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool how much they range fish to fish. And then... And how similar some can be. Yeah, and another. then this right here would be part of a northern anchovy scale, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, just making like sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so a good variety of fish in there. Yeah. Do you want to show beak? So, this sample didn't have any beaks, but we can go ahead and show some from a different sample. Um, so let's see if this... So, yeah, so you can go ahead and see the cephalopod beaks that we would be taking um, from samples if they were there. Um, cephalopods um, are probably not what we want to be finding in the, um, in the samples because they're also one of these species that have um, less nutritional, less um, energetic value for um, the sea lions. But as you can see, those are just some, and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are actually market squid beaks, um, and we can tell that based on how pigmented it is towards the tip of the beak, mm -hmm. and kind of how it fades out through the rest of the beak. Um, yeah, it's and an upper and lower, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they have upper and lower beaks, kind of like a bird, and so that allows them to, you know, catch their prey and eat them. <laughs> So yeah, by counting those in a similar way, we count the otoliths, we can infer how many squid were eaten by the sea lion. 
And we also take measurements, which is pretty tricky, I've found out. <laughs> they fly uh, everywhere. They fly. So we, we try to hold them down to take measurements of these um, beaks. Yeah. And with those measurements, they have like a, an algorithm that they can estimate the size of the squid that it came from. And same with the otoliths. That's why we measure those, too. They can get the general size of these prey items with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we did pull out a, um, some from our reference just to show you guys um, some variety of um, otoliths. So this is a speckled sand dab. And you can see they look a little different than the other species that we um, saw, which was northern anchovy and, um, and Pacific cake. So those yeah. are just some differences. Um, we also, and those, the sand dabs are also less, have less um, energetic value for them. But these are um, sardines, Pacific sardines, and these are actually really good for them. So, um, trying to get a good view of them. So these look a little bit different than most of the other ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're kind of similar to the northern anchovy yeah. in a way, but they have like a longer rostrum, we call it, or that nosy part at the end. So that's how we can mm -hmm. tell those apart. Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much what we look for in our samples. Um, it varies sea lion to sea lion, but we usually see similar fish. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, so we have a couple minutes to answer some questions if you guys have any more for us. Yeah. Let's see if we missed any um, mm -hmm. before. Anchovy is a sign of a healthier ocean. Indicators, yeah, <laughs> good mm -hmm. use of that term. Yeah. We like anchovy um, for our marine wildlife. Um, they're very nutritious. Let's see, what is that round thing? That might have been a fisheye lens that you saw. It looks like a little bead. Yeah. Um, those are fisheye lenses. We don't look at those with the sea lion diet. Are those specifically from squid? Yeah, those were squid and beaks. Mm -hmm. Market squid. Yeah, sometimes we do find octopus beaks. Uh, like the California mm -hmm. two-spot octopus is pretty common in some of these samples. Mm -hmm. um, but usually it's different squid. <laughs> Are we paused? <laughs> well, okay. So we have any I think more? Maria had a question. Marie. Um, yeah. From Lishka. Yeah, do. What is your relationship with California sea lions like? Did you have a spe special affinity for them before you began your grad work? So I didn't, um, but um, I've worked with many animals before. Um, so I was very excited to get to work with um, an animal like California sea lions um, and their diet. Um, uh, are you guys experiencing this pausing that we are? I hope not. Um, let us know. <laughs> Does age of sea lion depend on their main diet? Um, mm, good question, Chris. Yeah. I believe. Expert. Yeah. <laughs> I believe they. It differs um, just from range wise, um, but. Um, it does differ from female and male, I believe. I think males are gonna be, or forage um, farther, um, but I think females forage, um, like can forage longer and they, you know, need to have more um, because they um, are nursing their young. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Do you have any 
advice on how to get into grad school. <laughs> mm. um, I think the advice that I would give would be um, don't be shy. Um, read a lot and ask questions. Um, you know, that's, that's my best advice that I would give someone. Um, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, everybody's this, especially the conservation uh, community, everybody is very nice and willing to help you. And yeah. Yeah, good answer. Yeah. Good answer. Quinn says, Becky knows all about them fish islands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a plastic study on seabirds and I thought mm -hmm. the fish islands were micro plastic, or um, micro beads that you find in like exfoliating face washes and stuff. And I couldn't get an answer. Um, and then I did, and now I work with the, I see the fish eye lenses every day. <laughs> They're haunting yeah. me. <laughs> uh, let's see, okay, good. I guess the interruption was just for us. So any last minute questions? Um, mm -hmm. Just a reminder, our next live is on March 9th at 11 a.m. It's our last one, so you better tune in. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah we're just gonna go over um, data results <clears throat> from last year, 2020, and just a little trivia game and Q&A with Olivia and me. And Maria. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it online just says us, but oh, Maria might join us, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it should be pretty fun. And then if you have more questions for us, you know, just in general about this field or, like, how we got here, where we're going, <clears throat> um, yeah, you can ask those then as well. Yeah. So I think we've reached our time limit. Yeah. Thank you for joining. Thank you for participating. Mm -hmm. As always, these are um, still uploaded after we end the live. So you can watch it later or send yeah. it to a friend. Yeah. yeah. Share with friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so thanks for joining. Thank I hope you all have you. a great week. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.